to avoid giving in to the temptation of continuing, as soon as she gets to the end of a scenario, she immediately starts hunting for another trigger. Often, she asks others for stories. Sophie is the sultana, actually, of a thousand and one nights. She always asks for stories. Next segment is called Entropy. In her study of Carl's work, Van Zalen notes the important role of, of feigned or real anticipation in her game. This is a common ingredient of monomaniacal obsession. But with Carl, it is not a usual type, aimed at filling an empty life with an overflow of affect. It is not the matter of getting oneself into a state while setting up a target that can be reached sooner or later. Carl's anticipation are often the wrong way around. The closer she gets to the goal, the colder things become. That is because, because our universe, which is saturated with information, is entropic. It obeys this law of information theory, according to which the more a message is predictable and undifferentiated, the more it becomes statistic noise. An expected event is no longer an event, waiting for and hoping are direct opposites, etc. In exquisite pain, Carl puts this law into practice. The book is divided up into two calm downs or, as the author suggests, a counter and a countdown. The first part is a diary, a log, a scrapbook, in which she daily pours crumbs of information, photographs, travelogues, various fragments, concerning her life from the instant she left Paris and the man she loves until the dramatic end of her journey when, instead of meeting her, all doiled up for the occasion in some exotic hotel, he cruelly and definitely stood her up. The telegram is Exhibit A. M can't join you in Delhi, due accident in Paris and stay in hospital, contact Bob, thanks. Exhibit B is a photograph of a catastrophe on a double spread, with unused bed in the hotel room upon which a red telephone is its pride of place. The caption reads, January 25, 1985, 2 a.m., room 261, Imperial Hotel, New Delhi. The second countdown is bifocal. The same photograph of the ominous hotel room with a red telephone is reproduced at the top of each left-hand page. But the caption, Sophie's sad tale of a lover's betrayal, told again and again almost every day during three months, is always slightly different. On the right-hand page, she pastes a new story, illustrated with a different photograph each time, gathered from people in answer to this question, when did you suffer most? most? Now, a lot could be said about this work, which I think is one of the best, but I would like to focus on its entropic nature, and thus underlines two passages occurring in the second part, in the second countdown, after the catastrophe. On the left-hand pages, the successive versions of the tale of betrayal are shorter and shorter, and printed with an ink that is progressively fading. The first version fills all the space left on the page and the, under the photograph of the bedroom. It is printed in white on black ground. It begins with, five days ago, the man I love left me, a sentence that one will find almost verbatim at the start of each daily entry, the only modification being that of a number indicating the date when each particular version of the tale was written down. The last version, printed in dark gray ink on black, almost unreadable, consists of only two lines. The fetish sentence, this one last time though, it is written in the past tense. 98 days ago, the man I loved left me. Then the caption of the double spread of the catastrophe photograph, January 25, 1985, 2 a.m., room 261, Imperial Hotel, New Delhi, to which Cal has added this simple word, enough. The various versions do not differ very much at the beginning. Sophie rambles, lost in her pain for having been dumped and her co contempt for the cowardice of the traitor and his crude lies, which, as an apprentice slur, she has quickly discovered. Three hours before the plane expected to bring a lover to India to cough, this man had called, had called her to confirm his arrival. The accident was only an ingrown toenail, and he stayed at the hospital only a visit to a podiatrist. Bob, who happened to be Carl's father on top of being a friend of the man in question, knew nothing whatsoever when Sophie called him in the middle of the night. His name had obviously been invoked in order to worry her even more, etc. Little by little, however, her indignation at the lies was replaced by an exhaustion in semantic unwinding. On the 30th day, uh, as, a, as a repetition of the story, that, that 20, she already, already had repeated the story 29 times before, as a repetition of the story was beginning to dull its horror, 
Sophie the forlorn has distanced herself enough from the catastrophe to be able to dissect the fateful telegram. I quote, as for style, what could say it is both economic and dramatic? Use of the third person, the hero having lost his faculties. Use of the father as an intermediary. Choice of words such words as hospital, an accident to inject some pathos. In fact, my father had only a clock at all, he knew nothing. It was two when I, when I learned from M himself that accident meant ingrown, ton ingrown toenail, and ingrown toenail meant breaking up. Thank you meant nothing. None of these facts are new. They had already been recited many times. What is new, and paradoxically, very paradoxically, constitutes an event, is a condemnation of language as babble, as entropic noise. Thank you meant nothing. The second event of this kind occurs almost at the very end of the book, I'm almost finished, in the entry regarding the 95th day after the catastrophe. One begins to read the umpteenth version of the tale of betrayal on the, on the right page. This, starts, starts, starts with, this one starts with, this is the same story. One knows that, of course. In fact, it's beginning to weigh the, weigh the reader down just as I'm wearing you down. But the sentence goes on. Except that it happened 95 days ago at 2 a.m. in an hotel room in New Delhi, that it is on the phone that I heard this voice of a man who would no longer come to me. Now, one understands that the same story in question is that on the right hand page, told by another abandoned woman. On August 8, 1983, at 4.30 a.m., he told me, I don't love you anymore. We were in the south of France, the room was overlooking a meadow. This might not be my biggest grief, but it's, a clo it's the last one which makes it the most precious, I dare say, and the closest one in my memory. This unknown woman that Carl quotes, uh, like she quotes every one, uh, all these stories, uh, at each of the uh, new right page, this unknown woman writes like Carl. Having found the same in an other's life, Carl can quit, the other can talk in her place, doesn't matter enough. 